Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Mila. I am a member of Raging Asian Women Taiko Drummers, and I use pronouns she, her, and they, them. And I'm going to be welcoming you to the panel, doing a few acknowledgments and thank yous, and then also talking a little bit about the naming and framing of today's conversation and sort of the questions and thoughts that are animating our dialogue. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge that even though we are gathered in virtual space, um, each of us is, of course, also materially located on land. Um, I am calling in from the settler colonial nation state of Canada, um, from Tuckeronto, or the city now known as Toronto. And I'd like to acknowledge that this is the land of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. But it's now also home to people from many First Nations, Inuit and Métis. Um, and that this is land covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is an agreement to peaceably share and care for the land and waters. Um, in giving thanks to the land and waters, acknowledging these original caretakers and those who also continue to steward this land um, under these forced conditions of colonization and enclosure, um, I'd also like to recognize the uh, rich and always present um, indigenous resistance and resilience here. And also to say in thinking through today's panel topic that the colonization and the co of land and the colonization of gender are interlocking. So even though we may not be talking about land directly today um, in recognizing my position as a settler, my complicities and my responsibilities, um, recognizing that liberation and land are uh, need to always be part of the, that same conversation. Um, I'd also like to thank our partner and sponsor. So we are partnering with Tyco Community Alliance today. Um, TCA is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to uh, empower the people and advance the art of Tyco. Uh, it's founded and largely powered by a dedicated teams of volunteers um, and TCA curates Tyco related resources, uh, sponsors community centric programming and produces the biennial North American Tyco conference. Uh, these efforts are all made possible by the support of TCA members um, whose membership not only entitles them to discounts or early access to programming and special offers, but also serves to directly sustain the Tyco community through supporting programs such as this one today. Um, so you can visit tycocommunityalliance.org slash join for more info about being a member. And then this talk is also being sponsored by the York Center for Asian Research, um, which brings together researchers interested in uh, historical and contemporary experiences of um, or lived Asian experiences around the world. Okay. And a quick uh, piece of logistics is that um, today we're going to be using the chat function for audience participation or engagement. So please comment, um, offer your questions. We have someone moderating the chat who will save your questions. Um, and hopefully we'll get to some of them in the Q&A at the end. And also if there are thoughts uh, you want to offer to the panelists, we'll save the chat at the end so the panelists will also be able to read through it. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the naming and the framing of the panel, um, Women and Tycho, Moving Beyond Binaries, Gender and Racial Justice in Tycho, or sorry, what did I say? Um, women and Tycho, Women and Tycho, Moving Beyond Binaries. Um, I'm actually going to talk a little bit more about the spelling of women with an X for a later question, but I think right now the important thing to say is that the X is a visual disruption that invites some questions and reflections about gender. Um, and when we talk about moving beyond binaries, um, something we're really reflecting on is moving beyond binary thinking. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about what binary thinking uh, means. So when we think about race, uh, gender, class, sexuality, ability, citizenship, and other categories of identity or say social location, um, dominant Western modes of thought often construct these into divisions or binary divisions. So uh, we might think about um, male and female, man and woman, uh, white and black or white and person of color, um, straight or LGB, lesbian, gay, bisexual, uh, able-bodied or disabled, well or ill, a citizen or foreigner and rich or poor. And these are kind of familiar binary constructions that we, we know of. Um, as I go through them, what also kind of might become 
apparent is that each of these binaries is structured by a particular power relation. So one side of the binary, you know, we're taught to understand as superior, um, meaning it's either uh, considered a more normal, more value, valuable, um, more desirable, more ideal. And then those that fall on the other side of the binary, we know socially and historically tend to have less and inequitable access to things like social services, healthcare, um, affordable housing, uh, fair and dignified labor, freedom of mobility, um, education. And so this binary also results in very material uh, impacts. Um, and thinking through these these power relations, we can also connect them then to unequal systems of power or ideologies that we know of as oppressive. So uh, we're thinking about patriarchy, racism, heterosexism, ableism, transphobia, xenophobia. And we can see the connections between this binary thinking and then these uh, harmful isms. As we also think about uh, binary thinking as a kind of either or, um, where you can either be, you know, one or the other according to the constructed binary, we recognize too that those binaries can't capture the complexities of our lived experiences. So I think, you know, each of us could probably already, you know, think of a way that we actually already live beyond binaries. Um, we experience the world beyond binaries, but something happens sometimes when we have to try to articulate our experiences um, or try to express them. And what happens is we often get anchored into this binary. Um, we remain kind of uh, stuck in our articulations uh, along binary terms. Um, so then in thinking about, you know, these binary problems, something that then might happen or often happens is we end up coming up with also binary solutions. So a binary solution could be something like if the problem is exclusion, we turn to inclusion. If the problem is invisibility, visibility, um, lack of recognition, more recognition, uh, less of a group, more of a group, something like that. Um, and these solutions often don't necessarily address the underlying binary. In fact, they keep it intact. So what does it mean to try to think of solutions to binary problems that also unsettle that foundational binary formation? Um, you know, in the current moment of racial uprising, we are seeing a lot of companies and organizations and brands uh, talk about needing more diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, especially in response to the global movement for Black lives. And while we recognize these things as important, the question that we keep asking in that context is, okay, how do we do those things and unsettle the formations of white supremacy? And similar here, we're talking about um, how do we talk about maybe diversity, equity, inclusion while also unsettling the gender binary? Um, so instead of binary thinking, uh, partly what we're thinking about on this panel today is how do we move towards a more expansive thinking on race and gender? Um, how do we refuse uh, easy categorization? How do we think about gender in ways that remain open to um, complexity, transformation, um, change possibility uh, and and think about it in ways that aren't about um, uh, staying in these limited or binary category formations. Um, so with that intro, thank you for listening. I'm going to invite all of our panelists to join us on screen. Um, I'm so grateful today that we are being joined by um, Christy Oshiro, Angela Algren, Deborah Wong, Waijang Ku, um, Michelle Fuji and Izumi Sakamoto, who's going to be moderating our panel. And Izumi, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Mira, for that fabulous opening and articulating problems that we were trying to address today. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. My name is Izumi Sakamoto, um, and I'm going to be moderating today. And I'm going to just uh, turn to our uh, panelists, and uh, I would like everybody to introduce yourselves and speak a little to how the topic of women with X and Taiko relates to your work or lived experience. I'm going to start with uh, Christy. Everyone, uh, my name is Christy Oshiro. I use all pronouns. I am, I am a fourth generation. Japanese, Okinawan-American, born and raised on Hawaii Island. I 
identify as queer, pansexual, gender queer, or gender non-binary, which means my gender identity is not exclusively masculine or feminine. I grew up playing taiko from age nine and have been playing taiko for 28 years now. And taiko has been my only job for the last 18 of those years. I've played with Honadai Fukuji Taiko, Portland Taiko, Sacramento Taiko Dan, and I currently tour with Taiko Za. I am the creative director of Placer Ume Taiko, a Buddhist temple Taiko group. I also am an instructor at San Mateo Buddhist Temple Taiko. I also teach Taiko Confusion, which is a group located in Nevada City. And also I have a student group called Soko Taiko. And I'm the leader and founder of Queer Taiko based in Oakland, California. It's a lot of groups. <laughs> Even though I identify as non-binary, I grew up being raised as a girl. It was how I was being seen and it has been the way the Taiko community sees me to a large extent. Growing up, I, I didn't feel comfortable with the pressure put on me to comply with female gender norms, the pressure to wear dresses, shave this, pluck that, how to sit, how to act, who to love. I remember being small and playing house with my friends and I always wanted to be the dog because none of the roles that my friends were playing like it were anything that I could see myself as. Um, I felt so uncomfortable that I ended up rejecting all things feminine and it, that didn't feel right to me either but um, it was what I chose to do at the time what I felt like was my only choice. I it affected the way that I grew up playing taiko. I had a very masculine view of what a strong taiko player should look like. And, and that's how I played taiko. I had a very kind of uh, aggressive taiko style. And it's taken me a long time to realize that, that that wasn't really me. And ever since then, I've been trying to find my own taiko path as my true self. Thank you so much, Christy. That was touching. So thank you for starting us off in this honest, authentic conversation. Um, I think this is going to really help us thinking through this uh, issue of binary problem. Now um, I'm going to turn to Angela. Thank you so much for including me in this um, panel. I'm really excited to join um, this wonderful group of scholars and artists and thinkers. Um, I'll start, I guess, a little bit with my with my Taiko biography, um, which is that I started playing Taiko with Mu Daiko in Minneapolis and played um, from 1999 till a, about 2007 ish. Um, and I think in many ways that was one of the most formative of my Taiko experiences because it was the longest. Um, I, I had the opportunity to be a little bit of a, a Joe Daiko hanger on a couple of times when I was doing my dissertation research. Um, and then I've gone a long time without playing Taiko because I've been in different academic jobs and I was finishing up my dissertation. Um, and, uh, but I have had the opportunity at my institution, Bowling Green State University, to teach a class or two um, and kind of interact with a local group here. And so that has been a really um, great way to kind of feel like I'm back in the Taiko world a little bit. And of course, during all that time, I've, I've um, gone to NATC and, and was part of the Women in Taiko Summer Intensive where um, which I think was a really intense, you know, appropriately intense experience for the attendees, um, including myself. And um, so I guess I, one of the things I, I will say is that um, all of these experiences informed my academic work on Taiko, that I didn't come to Taiko as an academic first, but kind of came as already a Taiko player, interested in um, thinking about race <clears throat> and also gender and sexuality and how you know, how somehow these things come together and, and intersect with each other on stage, but, but in some ways more importantly off stage. Um, 
And I think I, I'm, I'm really moved by what Christy shared. And I think, and then I'll say for myself, I'm a queer identified bisexual cisgender woman. Um, and for me, uh, the gender performance aspect of Tycho as a performer and also as a spectator has always been really exciting for me. Um, what Tycho maybe enables for people who are woman identified, what it gives room for, um, but also as I think many people, I, I shouldn't say many, but I think as Christy just outlined, that's a really complicated thing and not purely liberatory and purely um, to be celebrated either. And so I think that complicated terrain is, is what is so compelling. And I think um, this conversation is so important too, because I think it is also asking me to rethink some of the things that, that I've written and thought about up until now. Great, thank you so much, Angela. Um, and maybe you can say a word about your book. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, so the, the dissertation that I um, wrote as a graduate student became the kind of basis for my book, which is called, oh, I have it right here, Drumming Asian America, um, Tycho Performance and Cultural Politics. And, um, and I explore um, really through mostly three groups, which is Mudaiko, San Jose Taiko, and, and Joe Daiko, which is one of Tiffany Tamaribuchi's groups, um, the, the cultural politics that are embedded in Taiko performance. And so um, that was published in 2018. And I, I actually feel like so much had just was just on the cusp of changing in like 2017, 2018, and especially now in the past six months. And so um, there's a lot of exciting stuff to, to be thinking about and, and engaging in. Great, thank you so much, Angela. And speaking of past six months, I think Michelle is one of the people who are really instrumental in moving things along. Um, so I'm gonna just let her speak about that. Michelle Fuji, please. Okay, hi. Um, thank you so much for this panel. I'm really, I don't know, just feeling the, the depth of gathering today. Um, I'm Michelle Fuji, um, based in Portland, Oregon, on the land of Multnomah, Clackamas, Cowlitz, Tualatin, Bands of Chinook, and many tribes who made their homes along the Columbia River. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a cisgender woman and fourth generation Japanese American. Um, I've been a taiko artist for over 25 years, and uh, currently I'm a co-founder and a co-director of Unit Sozo, um, full-time. <laughs> so, um, yeah, just, uh, well, I mean, Izumi, first you, you mentioned uh, this uh, past three months. Yes, I've been really steeped in this conversation, which is connected to, um, this world, this oppressive world of binary definitions, um, through, and and then also um, organized this incredible, incredible ex online experience um, called Reimagining a New World, um, which was really amazing to be um, doing alongside with so many people in the Taiko community, many people in this room here were also um, involved. Um, but for me, I just, I guess to answer the question, um, I, I too would go back into childhood um, in my formative years of living and really trying hard to please um, the societal community, the family obligations, expectations and definitions of gender. Um, hearing things like good girls do this, girls shouldn't do this um, and living in those sentences and letting that guide my, guide who um, the choices that I made. Um, later on, I'll say it did, it's not that after childhood, then everything became free. I'll just say even later on, <laughs> it shifted to coded language um, in my professional life even. Words like, this is the way it is done. Um, to even, this is what success looks like. And, and there, and I spent, and I will say, I spent many years unsuccessfully, <laughs> unsuccessfully trying hard to buy into this. Um, and when I, while I did try uh, to fit in, 
um, do what was outlined um, for many years. It was inside of me. Um, no one could see the inside of what was happening to me, but the inside of me was um, living in this perceived wrongness. I always felt wrong and I need to shift myself. I need to change myself. I need to be this chameleon of something else, but inside something continued to, um, to be sort of shouting and saying, remember, remember me. Um, and so it, it's taken me many years to excavate, unpack, redefine, build confidence, articulate, and then take action. That's, this is this outward representation of myself. Um, and I do still feel like a work in progress. Um, and while I have recognized some of the destructive cycles that um, live within me, I um, have, have really tried to spend a lot of, um, I don't know, conscious time, intentional time, maybe that's the word, intentional time, um, to really pause and and continue to ask myself questions because I think even sometimes the natural sense of me is the conditioned me. And so living within all of that, I've um, started to build practices of enjoying that um, almost hesitation of self um, because it's been a really rich conversation that I continue to have. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was really deep. Um, and I also would like to uh, thank the huge leadership that you have showed for the past few months and along with Karen Young, um, without which we couldn't have had really rich conversations with all of the people who have participated. So thank you so much for setting that uh, us on the path. Now I'd like to turn to Mila, who's um, courageously organized this panel. Really appreciate it, Mila. Hi, thank you. Um, so uh, yes, my name is Mila and I use she, her, and they, them pronouns. And I'm um, a member of Raging Asian Women Taiko Drummers, um, which is actually the first way that I came to Taiko. I had just moved to Toronto in 2015. I went to see, or 2016. One of those years I went to see uh, one of their concerts and I definitely had this feeling of like, oh, I need to do that. Whatever is happening on stage, I need to do that. Um, and so I feel really grateful and also just constantly surprised to find myself here and in this company and really grateful for that. Um, in terms of, uh, and maybe I'll speak a little bit about my lived experience as well. I think um, it's actually, this was the hardest question to think about um, because I think it is hard to find language um, for these kind of experiences of discomfort and of confusion and, and Michelle, what you said of hesitation to, um, and like living in those sentences, like language can be very, um, sometimes pull us in, in directions that aren't resonant as well. Um, so I would say that, uh, Yes, there's been a sort of like persistent discomfort and I think disidentification for me with um, not just the behavioral attributes that were assigned to me, but also with uh, the meanings that were assigned to my body and to particular parts of my body and what those are supposed to mean. And I think um, uh, as, a, as an aside to this outside of Teco, I'm a PhD student um, and I'm in gender feminist and women's studies and even thinking about it in a sort of politicized feminist context that even in those spaces where there was a sort of assumption about um, shared experiences because of shared body parts or similar you know ass assumptions about body parts even that felt very uncomfortable and um, and and I, yeah I've had to pay attention to that discomfort as well um, so I think while yes I don't really identify as cis and I don't really identify as trans and I think I'm also wary of trying to name an identity at all because of these challenges of language. Um, the thing that feels uh, most resonant is um, like uh, looking for and learning to be in ways that uh, are about challenging those underlying assumptions. And I think I'm often most comfortable in my body and in my gender when I'm sort of not thinking about it. And usually when I'm called to think about it, it's a moment of discomfort that um, can often be generative because it points me towards uh, some type of like rigidity that doesn't fit and doesn't 
um, doesn't work and maybe reveals some of the limitations of those binaries. Um, yeah, actually, I think I'm going to uh, leave it there. I'm sharing this panel space with Ku. We're both here for Ross. I'm going to, I'm going to pass to Ku now as the other um, part, or yes, my better okay. half right now. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Mila. So Ku, would you like to go? Yes, thanks, Mila. Um, I just want to say I'm feeling, I also came to Tycho very recently, like in the past three years. I'm feeling really humbled and grateful to be on this panel um, with all these other panelists who have been um, doing this work for uh, a much longer time than me. So I just wanted to acknowledge that and say thank you. Um, my name is Ku. Uh, most people use they, them pronouns to refer to me. Um, I accept all pronouns. Um, I am a queer person. I'm a mixed race person of European settler and Hong Kong Chinese ancestry. Um, I am also a, uh, outside of Taiko, a multidisciplinary artist. Uh, I'm a person living with chronic illness, so lots of my work as an artist is focused on and rooted in disability justice. Um, as I said, I've been drumming with Ross since about 2017. Um, and I also wanted to, uh, I also identify as well, similarly to like what Mila was talking about, about um, sort of like this idea of disidentification or finding difficulty in assigning language to my gender. I think the closest thing that I have found for myself, if I do need to choose words, is uh, genderqueer. Um, and I, I wanted to talk about that too. Yeah, I, like most people um, so far have, have spoken about, like locate myself within this conversation of women and Taiko. Um, and also talk about like how I fit in, how I find my space within RAW, which is also like raging Asian women and perceived to be as a women's group and we are um, a women's group. And um, I do, I think, yeah, I've struggled a lot with, with sort of language and how to talk about it, but um, there are parts of me that do identify with the word woman, but very specifically when there's um, a certain context, proper context, uh, which is a context that I do find in raw, um, which I feel is a space that like celebrates and visibilizes radical queer Asian femininity, um, which is also something that I identify with as a genderqueer person. Um, yeah, and and more on this piece about context, like when I think about raw and our name, um, we're not just like raging women or Asian women taiko drummers or um, raging Asian taiko drummers. We're like raging Asian women taiko drummers, which is um, specific to a very specific experience um, that I definitely find myself in. Um, and offers space for me to not have to like dissect my identity because um, I don't think I don't know that I would necessarily um, find space for myself in just like a women's group or just a Asian group um, or just a, a raging group I think like the trifecta the three of them mm -hmm. sort of create this like rounded um, experience that I feel really encompasses some of the nuances and complexities of my gender that I struggle to put into words. Um, so yeah, all of this to say that I am raging Asian woman and also a gender group person. And I think those two things can coexist. And I'm really excited that there's so many other people on this panel um, and in the Taiko community who are um, wanting to bring this conversation to the forefront of like the women in Taiko community. Uh, and I'm really eager to try and tease apart some of those like messier um, and more layered pieces um, relating to gender and bring this more forward in the, in the Taiko community. Thank you so much, Ku. Uh, together with Mila's uh, conversation sharing, uh, I'm really looking forward to what Ro will bring to us in the next while with this complex, complex idea of gender and your struggles with that um, binaries. So. Um, now off to Deborah. Would you like to share? 
Yeah, um, although really at the moment what I would most like to do is just to sort of sit with what we've already heard because I, I just like so, I'm so moved. I'm so, um, you know, grateful that each of you are willing to share in the ways that you have. Um, yeah, um, I'm Deborah, Deborah Wong. I'm in Southern California in Riverside. Um, I'm in an area that, um, you know, in terms of sovereignty is really uh, Cahuilla, Serrano, Luiseno, and Tongva. Um, I live at the foot of a local landmark, a mountain, which is contested space right now in a really interesting and important way. Um, I am a third generation Chinese American, I'm multi-ethnic. Um, as I usually say, I am 110% Asian American. Um, I am cisgender, um, I'm straight. And I'm over 60, you know, so there's a lot of things going on there. And, you know, like many of you, I, I am very glad that many of us are able to simultaneously be a lot of different things at the same time. And therein lies a lot of our power. Um, I played taiko really um, passionately with like incredible commitment from 1997 to 2009. It was at the center of, of my life for those years. Um, I ended up writing a book about it, but I did not go to Tycho thinking, oh, I want to write a book, I want to do research. <laughs> no, I was drawn to Tycho because um, I was searching as an Asian American woman. Um, I, was, um, I, I was feeling very deep needs to spend time with other Asian Americans in Asian American community through Asian American performance. Um, I found it, but my going modality, whether in Tycho or out, is um, impatience <laughs> always <laughs> always you know imagining more and better right you know so the group i was in was like amazing it was a taiko center of los angeles uh led by the late reverend tom Kurai. Uh, i learned so much from him um my taiko pals you know remain friends you know several of them rather good friends um you know with that said i was also fiercely impatient as well as you know fully committed the entire time i was in that group um you know, it was a majority Japanese American women uh, in the group. Um, um, nonetheless, there was some really sort of deep sexist, you know, asymmetries, you know, driving the group, uh, a general unwillingness to talk about difference of any kind, you know. Um, you know, so I mean, it was basically a microcosm of, of, of the world at that level, you know, in terms of, um, you know, uh, having critical tools and critical and political willingness to sort of think outside the box, right? With that said, I miss those people tremendously, and I miss being in that group, and I miss the, the, um, the deep connections that I felt during those 12 years. I miss it terribly. I've remained connected to the, the Tycho world. I, I show up. I, 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 you know, I go to things. I was part of the Women of Tycho um, um, you know, Institute uh, in San Diego. I was part of Michelle's and Karen's amazing gathering this summer. Um, um, I'm missing Obon very much. I'm dancing Bon Odori in my living room with remote gatherings. Um, I show up, you know, and I'm fully committed to um, continuing to think about what Tycho uh, could become needs to become, all those things. And I'm also aware that there's now 111 people here with us today. Um, I just clicked through the names of, you know, who's here. And I'm seeing so many, you know, friends, people who I would like to become friends with, you know, and I'm just really, again, very struck by the, um, uh, what I see as eagerness within our community to think and talk about, about these issues, you know. So thank you to all of you participants for showing up today. Thank you, Deborah. Would you like to show your book also? <laughs> right, I wrote a book. Um, um, I could show you, or Angie could show you the book. <laughs> We're both holding each other's books, and you know why? Because Angie and I have spent a lot of time talking and learning together over many years. I'm you know, just so, so glad to have these sort of Tycho scholarly pals, you know, um, out there in the world. Um, my book is actually free. Um, you can buy a hard copy if you want, but I very intentionally arranged for it to be open access, as they say. So you can, it, it's, um, it's about my years of learning Tycho. It is very much a deep dive in, into race and gender. Um, you know, um, and it ends on a note of, of, of both hope and despair in terms of anti-racist work. Um, the book can be gotten for free on Kindle for, you know, you buy it for zero dollars and zero cents, or you can get it online as a PDF. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you for asking. Great. Thank you so much, Deborah. Um, uh, there was a request from Lee to put the names of uh, Angela and Deborah's books in chat. So if uh, one of you can do that, that would be great. Um, we still have a few more minutes left for this introduction part. So I'm going to insert myself and say who I am, in case some of you are wondering. Uh, my name is Izumi Sakamoto. I'm a Japanese immigrant to Canada. Um, and uh, I'm a cisgendered queer uh, person who identifies as she, her. And uh, I have played taiko with Ro for 10 years as a performing member from 2005 to 2014. And uh, currently uh, playing with Ishin Daiko also in Toronto with the Buddhist church. And um, I get, yeah, it's been so enriching and uh, insightful. It, the, you have, the panelists have shared uh, so much already, so I'm just trying to find words uh, to describe my own thinking. And, but uh, um, yeah, I think me, my becoming part of role, I have, I was, I came to Canada in 2002, but previous to that, I was in Michigan, USA. And there I was just a foreigner, an international student. Um, and coming to Toronto to work, I work at the University of Toronto in social work. I'm a faculty member um, in conducting research on Japanese Canadian arts and um, culture uh, and activism. So called JCAP, Japanese Canadian Arts and Activism Project. So with that context, I also look at Taiko as well as other visual arts, uh, and uh, other kinds of art theater uh, by Japanese Canadian artists in response to the history of um, incarceration and disposition. Anyway, um, yeah, so through uh, my experience with Raw, I feel that uh, I was Japanese immigrant and I became Asian Canadian um, by working with mostly um, Asian Canadian members, um, reflection, and just hours and hours of uh, talking and thinking. Uh, Roll trace its roots to um, Wasabi Daiko that was around for 10 years by three members, uh, former mem uh, founded by three former members of Katari, four, four former members of Katari Daiko, which uh, is the first uh, Taiko group in Canada that started in Vancouver. Uh, which was influenced by Sando de Taiko and San, San Francisco Taiko Dojo in the US. So tr remotely tracing its roots to uh, uh, Asian American and Asian Canadian activism from 60s and 70s. So that genealogy um, became very important to me to feel that I, even though I came from elsewhere, I was part of this um, social movement, uh, claiming voice and uh, finding space um, and disrupting the uh, stereotypes and um, finding our own meaning or our own definitions of who we are. So that was really significant to me as a personal development, part of per personal development and also scholarly development as well. Um, also, I struggle with um, Taiko's ableist and masculine uh, image or um, mandate, I should say, um, coming from Japan. In Japan, Japanese culture is somehow sort of essentialized as, you know, one thing and people keep on drawing from that, but a Japanese culture is not one thing either. And um, so as a person with uh, disability, I also struggle with almost, um, you know, non-existent kind of identity as a disabled taiko player uh, and what that means and so forth. So um, yeah, and I just came back from Japan um, attending to my family emergency and where I was reminded that I was a son of my father. So my father treats me differently than my two sisters. I'm a middle sister of three daughters. And I sit with my uh, legs apart. I speak loudly and I am rough um, and I was uh, con 
that continuously I was reminded that I was too loud at home and I did, was too rough and was not too, I was not gentle enough. And, I, and then I remember, remember that how I tried to behave that way uh, since 12 years old, um, being part of Japanese, all, all girls Japanese high school experience. I wanted to behave like a boy, but not to become a boy. Um, and uh, mixing up with uh, super femme and super butch kind of identities as what I grew up with. So, um, we, so we're looking back about that and sort of putting that into the context of Taiko, I see that how I found my voice in Taiko in that way to um, integrate different spectrum of gender identities I had without really naming it that way. Anyway, so this has been really enriching already to hear from different panelists, but now um, I would like to turn to um, everybody, uh, each individually. Um, so if you could, uh, panelists, I'm gonna start with Angela. So if the rest of you could turn off the video and if you have anything that came up to you while listening to other panelists, maybe you can add that to your individual sharing. So now Angela, uh, first off, uh, thank you for joining again. Uh, question to you is that, could you help us understand a little of Taiko's historical relationship to the political? In particular, how was the more visible emergence of Taiko in North America in the 60s and 70s connected with gender and racial social movements of the period? So please take it on. Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, one thing I wanted to start out by saying is that I think probably everyone on this panel has a lot of knowledge of their own, just from their own group's lineage. And I hope that you know we can we can kind of piece together other histories. But um, I also wanted to share um, in the notes that in the kind of um, outline that Mila sent. Um, to panelists, she kind of had a, a ta an addendum to this question that helped me think about the history of Tycho in a little bit of a more nuanced way. She wrote, in thinking about this question, I was reflecting on how Tycho groups are often narrated along the binary of political versus apolitical and wondering about the implication of this genealogy. And I think that's a really smart way to think about it. I think as soon as she, um, as soon as I read those words, I, I thought, yep, that's, that's really true. Um, and so I wanted to start by acknowledging that, that I think that's a, a great kind of, another great way to kind of start thinking about how binaries in, influence our thinking. Um, I think for those of us who are or have been active in Tycho groups and Tycho communities, we sort of develop a shorthand that we almost may not be aware of, with which to think about some obvious examples, we might put a group like Genki Spark or Raging Asian Women as explicitly political Tycho groups. And maybe we think about someone like San Francisco Tycho Dojo or Tycho Project or, or others as being not political or as being quote unquote professional. Um, and I think that one implication of this binary is that being political can sometimes operate as code for being not as serious artistically, um, or political might mean that the group is doing social work and not doing art, um, as if art were not a kind of social work. But um, but I think that this there's high stakes to this, especially for groups who have members who want to work as full time artists. Um, if enough people believe in this binary that um, using performance as a form of activism evacuates it somehow of true artistry, um, that, that, that means something to people who are trying to secure gigs in a kind of performing arts world that's invested in a white European tradition that kind of pits a kind of pure aesthetics against political art. And so um, this is not a binary that I want to invest in, but I also have spent enough time in university arts departments to know what we're up against. Um, plenty of people trying to kind of break down that binary, but I think that that's um, an uphill battle. I think that another implication of this sort of political, apolitical binary is that um, if 
a group, let's say in the US or Canada is adhering to um, what they perceive as Japanese etiquette and terminology and hierarchies in their practices that they are being apolitical. And I think Izumi, as you just pointed out, um, that is also already kind of too simplified um, a thinking and maybe a kind of Orientalism that's cementing a certain type of Japanese-ness. Um, but so, you know, I think one of the questions I have, and I, it, and I can only really pose it as a question because it's not something I have kind of pursued in, in a research agenda, um, but I wonder, you know, what is it, what would we find if we really wanted to, to kind of do a kind of deep dive into um, what it means to people to use Japanese etiquette in their taiko groups and, and what kinds of hierarchies or assumptions that that calls to mind. And I'm thinking here about just one of the things that I admire about Deborah's book is how she takes some of the most central material objects of taiko, like the drum and the t-shirt and drills down into their histories um, to really reveal these deep sort of political inequalities whether that is about the the kind of class system um, of who makes drums or about the sort of racialized labor practices of clothing manufacturing ma manufacturing so i think it would be interesting to think about um you know focusing a kind of question on what does this mean when people want to kind of maybe eschew asian american or asian canadian political histories for a kind of pure japanese-ness um, my assumption really is that most groups are not political or apolitical, but some kind of complex web of people whose experiences change throughout their lives, um, who, groups whose memberships change, um, you know, and, and when they have a long enough history, sometimes those genealogies are lost. Um, but to kind of, I think to return to maybe the first part of the question, which is really kind of outlining some of the ways that um, early Taiko groups were connected to racial and gender movements. Um, I think that the life history interviews that were conducted by curators at the Japanese American National Museum for the big drum exhibit are really telling. Um, it's not a, an enormous collection, but there's enough there that outline pretty clearly, I think, the ways that um, some, you know, people that we might, that, that we think of as in the kind of pioneer Taiko group, like George Abe, um, PJ and Roy Hirabayashi, um, Jean Mercer, um, and others, really kind of lay out explicitly the ways in which they were involved in Asian American activism, whether that was working on the, the magazine Ghidra, whether that was hanging out at the Amerasia bookstore in Los Angeles, um, whether that was kind of being involved in um, delivering community services to elders who didn't have access to it at the moment. And, and that a lot of these things were really um, uh, fueled or modeled after black power movement, a kind of power to the people sort of um, mode of activism. So th that history is very clear and it's there. Um, but I think as Deborah also astutely points out in her book, um, often our narratives about um, Taiko histories are don't include um, a lot of that explicit activism. I think that what is less clear um, is a kind of connection between early Taiko groups and players and women's movements um, or kind of explicitly talking about feminism. And I think that is probably complicated by a couple of factors. Um, one of which is that, uh, one of which is that I think because there's been a fraught relationship between white feminism and fem feminism communities of color, um, that that is probably a, already a fraught relationship. Um, but that there's also perhaps a kind of assumption that because women were part of Taiko from the beginning um, in Asian American Taiko, in North American Taiko, that 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 sort of counts as a feminist gesture. Um, and so um, that I guess that is where that's where I don't have as clear of an answer, but that I think is a really interesting question to pursue is that I think it, I think that um, It's become much more clear to me in the past three or four years that 
talking of, e even before kind of this much more recent conversation opening up about um, gender binary is that that assertions by women taiko players to um, want to play only with other women or in venues that are just for women audiences or when women performers um, are sometimes met with skepticism, defensiveness, um, confusion, <laughs> you know, so I think, I think that there are ways that um, even more recently conversations about gender and taiko have kind of struck some nerves and been a little bit difficult and that that sort of surprises me always in the moment until I can go back and reflect that in fact, you know, within a lot of activist communities that that that's not a new thing. Right. So um, I am confident, like I said, that others on the panel have a lot of knowledge about this history, too. So hopefully when we kind of go into the comment section, um, we can have a, a deeper discussion. Thank you so much, Angela. This um, really helps um, us in the context of gender. Um, how gender is perceived and enacted within Taiko community. Um, and I'm also thinking that it, how difficult it is to give up a privilege if you have been privileged um, by way of gender identity. So um, I see that surfacing and we sort of uh, supported by uh, referring to uh, sort of conventional Japanese culture and such. Uh, which may be a false reference, but still. Um, it has a lot of power. That's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. As a Japanese immigrant, I will say that. But anyway, so um, maybe we can come back to that issue later on. But now I would like to turn to Christy. So Angela, if you could go off the video. And Christy, could you come back, come back on the video? Yes, thank you. A question to you is that, how did you, your group, Queer Taiko, come into being? In what ways does this group respond to the gender binary or interact with gender politics in ways that are different from non-queer groups? Christy? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so, so for folks who don't know, Queer Taiko is an intergenerational and multicultural group of LGBTQIA pluses committed to building community and visibility through taiko drumming. And so seven years ago or so, I was looking for taiko teaching opportunities in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, and it became clear to me that I would have to start a group myself. Uh, but there were at the time and still today, there are lots of taiko groups already in the, the Bay Area. Uh, but I noticed that there were no specifically queer identified groups. Um, so I decided that that would be uh, something like a, something that's missing in the community, a space that I could fill. Uh, so I started a meetup group to let people know that we existed uh, and got on some uh, queer email lists. I rented a space and some taiko from Jimmy Nakagawa. Uh, and all in Taiko in the East Bay and scheduled like once a month meeting meetups just because that's like all I could commit to at the time and I, I had zero expectations for what 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 the group would be like how we would run things uh, if anyone would show up I had no idea like with with meetup uh, you know a bunch of people are SVP but then most people don't show up at all. They don't, they don't cancel. They don't say anything. They just like, so, um, but people did show up. Uh, a lot of my friends supported me and brought their friends, but it was, it was completely different people almost every single time. And that, uh, it was really fun and everyone got to meet a lot of good people and learn a lot together. And that lasted for about a year uh, until we lost our space. Um, and then it took me like another year or so to, to purchase, drums and find our current location which is in south which is at soundwave studios in oakland and now well now being like pre-pandemic we were practicing twice uh twice a month 
um, which was just a relatively new change, uh, moving up to twice a month. Sometimes we practice more if we have performances coming up. Performances is something are something that is new for the group too, even though we've been around for a long time. Our uh, queer taiko is a very uh, unusual, fluid, flexible group in that like it still today, like every time we meet, it's mostly completely new people who I've never seen before. Um, almost everyone who comes has zero taiko experience. And so our songs are very simple, easy to learn so that people can pick them up quickly and like join us on stage as, as soon as they feel comfortable. Uh, so a lot of people who perform with us have come in and maybe spent a few uh, weeks or months with us uh, for the specific, specific goal of performing on stage and being present and showing up and sharing their pride. And then after the performance, we probably won't see them again. And that's okay. You know, it's not because they had a bad experience. It's just that, um, you know, they got what they needed from that experience. And that's totally okay with, with me and with the rest of the group. It's, um, we also have taiko players that join us and visit us and play with us from other taiko groups. Um, uh, because they find something in queer taiko that they can't find it in other groups. And we welcome that as well. Um, for me, queer taiko has become a place where, where I personally can feel like truly free to be myself and not what others expect me to be. Um, there's no boxes for me to squeeze myself in or labels that I need to put on myself to define myself for other people. Um, we, you know, have no gender norms because our membership is spread over the full gender spectrum. And uh, it, the environment that we create, it reminds me about something I, I saw recently uh, on a show I was watching. There's a black gay game designer, his name is Gordon Bellamy. And he said, for marginalized people, a lot of energy is devoted to justifying your existence in spaces. And so when you see yourself placed as default, or in this case, the majority, uh, it has real meaning, it, it matters. And when I heard that, I was like, oh, that's totally queer taiko. Like when I'm with queer taiko around others that are like me, majority of others that are like me, that look like me, I can let my guard down, I can relax, I feel safe, I can be myself. And that's, a try, that's the space that I try to create for everyone who comes through our doors a space where they can not only like be free to be who they are, but also proud to be who they are and get up on stage and share their pride with others and inspire others. Um, queer Taiko, Queer Taiko's representation and the visibility that we provide in the community is really important to me because just, just by existing, uh, we challenge binary thinking. Every time we get up on stage and say our name, we're queer taiko. It's like we're waving all of our little pride flags, all of our different our different pride flags uh, for everyone in the audience who sees themselves in us or who knows someone like us. And we let them know that, that there are many different ways of being in this world, many different ways that many different ways that to play taiko that are completely valid and where we are that we are here, we exist, and that they are not alone. Thank you so much, Christy. I love to see Queer Taiko perform. It sounds so fascinating and wonderful. Um, and I also like to do a shout out to Joe Daiko, which you're part of, and Christy. Um, it's a group of, uh, that Tiffany Tamaribuchi started. And Joe Daiko comes up to uh, Canada every summer, usually, not with COVID this year, but um, at Powell Street Festival, which is um, largest, uh, longest running uh, cult Japanese Canadian cultural and art festival in Vancouver. And Jodaiko finished the day um, and everybody is so excited to see Jodaiko every year. And uh, that itself is such an affirmation for me to, to see such queer representation, queer women, uh, binary, non-binary people's representation on stage and everybody on all spectrum sharing for that, that 
is so um, empowering for me just to look at. So thank you for doing that work as well. So uh, thank you, Christy. And now I would like to move to Roll. So Mira and Ku, could you come to a video? Okay, so now we are past 3 p.m. So we're gonna be a little quickly moving through. Um, and this question is for you. Why and how did Ro decide to change the spelling of its name from women with E to women with X? How does Ro navigate being publicly perceived most often as a women's group with its internal work on the complexities of gender and queerness? Thanks. Thanks, Azumi. Um, oh, wait, Ku, did you want to? I did. Um, yes. I just wanted to, I know we're just like crunched on time, but I wanted to, as a quick aside before jumping into this question, um, just make a comment on uh, what Izumi, you mentioned in your intro about struggling with um, how disability identity can fit in with um, also being a taiko player or at a performer, um, which is something I, I grapple with a lot also as someone with a chronic illness. Um, I have a type of spinal arthritis and um, I think this is where in thinking in prepping for this panel I thought about this question I didn't know if it would come up but I think this is also a place where um, binary thinking sort of backs us into this corner of like you can you can be disabled or able-bodied you can be um, you can be a taiko drummer or like a, you could be somebody who's able to do uh, physical types of performance um, or not, or you can be well or unwell. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to um, acknowledge that and and uh, put a note that that for for everyone watching that like I think this is a um, a place where you wouldn't necessarily think that like binary thinking comes into play, but I think it's a huge piece of it. Um, and I wanted to thank you for bringing that up. That is so true. Thank you for uh, noting that. Cool. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about this first question of how Ra decided to change its the spelling of the name from women with an E to women with an X. Um, and I think that kind of official name change happened or started to be rolled out last summer, summer of 2019. Um, but it was following a very sort of long, I think, and sort of slow period of conversation within Ra about um, our relationships to the term or the category of women. And that was, those were, group conversation sometimes when it would come up um, about uh, maybe like a gig we were thinking about or um, or Ra's history and then sometimes it would be conversations between group members or or you know if something happened in a check-in or like in a day and we were checking in about it so gender kind of came up in in both intentional ways and then sometimes just through us sharing our experiences and getting to know each other um, and I think through these conversations, something that we were reckoning with or realizing is also that we have different experiences of being socialized as women or read as women. Um, and so our relationships to that term, you know, some were contextual, some were very positive and empowering relationships to that term, some were um, more confusing or negative or complicated, and there's quite a range. So we were thinking really about how do we create space within RAW for acknowledging those varied relationships, um, while also reflecting Ra's lineage as a, a, a group that came out of kind of women's political movement and organizing. Um, so I was looking into the spelling and I think um, as we've kind of already talked about, like uh, language terms are, are always imperfect, but um, so, so alternate spellings of women, um, one that came up in kind of 1976 or so with the Michigan Women's Music Festival is the spelling with a Y. Um, and that spelling in particular and kind of groups that use that spelling are more associated with an approach to gender that's very cis-centric. So meaning that um, woman for them is a biological thing, uh, means that to be a woman, you have to be assigned female at birth. Um, so it's an, an uh, definition of womanhood that uh, excludes trans women, excludes non-binary people, excludes gender non-conforming people who have a relationship to that term. Um, and so the, the spelling with a Y was not one that resonated with Ra. Um, the spelling with an X, it came out of or somewhat a counter to that. So it was um, from a more intersectional approach trying to recognize um, and 
validate uh, trans women, women identified people, and also to recognize that the, the other spelling with a Y um, also came out of movements that were predominantly led by white women and didn't account for the experiences of women of color. So the X also um, was a speaking to experiences of, of women of color. Um, and of course, as I said, yeah, the, the term itself is not perfect. Um, even, even as I was saying earlier, it still anchors us to a binary. It's still a term that calls to mind the word woman, and we still understand that word woman as having um, binary foundations. But for us, it was, the X was enough of a disruption to say um, that we have a more complicated relationship to gender within the group and also that the assumptions you might make of women within E were assumptions that we would want to disrupt here as well. Um, so it was, it's become, I think, less about a category of identity for Ra, but more of just a women as a category of experience that we all, everyone in the group navigates in some way or has some kind of relationship to. I'll pass to Ku. Thanks, Camila. Um, yeah, I want to echo a lot of the things you said. Um, I think it's changing, for me specifically, changing to women with an X also like specifically makes space for um, people who hold other identities, like non-binary people, gender queer people, gender non-conforming people who are in raw, um, because outwardly we are still perceived as uh, a group that people would think, oh, everyone in this group is is a woman, um, because not also not everyone really. I think the spelling of woman with an X is is still like a very new concept to a lot of people, um, and I think internally within raw, um, we've what I've understood is is that like what holds us together is not necessarily that we all have the exact same gender identities that we all identify as a woman in the same way. Um, but like Mila said, um, thinking about gender as an experience and that we all do experience gender in the same way um, and that we all experience the specific intersection of like misogyny and racism. Mm -hmm. We've all, um, you know, experienced, we've all been like stereotyped as like the docile, submissive Asian woman um, and even myself, like if even if I, I identify as, as genderqueer, um, when I move about the world, I, I still experience it as a woman. Like if I go out walking at night, like there's so many precautions that I'm taking. Um, I still experience misogyny. I still um, experience the threat of gendered violence. Um, and so I think, yeah, it's, it can sometimes, um, respect for Ra, Ra's current iteration who is in the group now um, can be difficult to extract um, identity from experience. Um, yeah, so basically what, what Mila said. And one last note uh, is that um, even though um, wh while the people, there are non-binary, genderqueer, non-conforming people in RAW who do feel um, comfortable representing a group to audiences that will be like, oh, this is a women's group, you're all women, um, that's not not every uh, gender non-conforming or non-binary person will feel the same way. So all of us who are in RAW and who do hold those identities um, are informed and do like consent um, and have our own process with how um, to navigate those, the things that come up with that. Great, thank you so much Mila and Ku. That was really articulated well. So I, I think some people were not aware of the differences between women with Y, E, and X. So, and internal process that went into that. Um, very thoughtful, reflexive process. So thank you so much for helping. So now I would like to move to Deborah. Yeah, and um, hey, there's some really interesting discussion already going on in chat, right? I <laughs> um, yeah. remember that E, Y, X, yeah. And yeah. um, so, let's remind yeah. ourselves that new terms and new spellings and all of that things that some people say, oh, that's just jargon. It's not just jargon. We need new words, new terms, new spellings to be able to think differently, right? You know, it's that simple as far as I can figure. Um, okay, yeah. so you've... Um, do you want to state my question? Um, sure. Yeah, or, uh, your I don't know. most recent yeah. Louder and Faster, Pain, Joy, and the Body Politic in Asian American Taiko. You write on many 
affects that arise in playing taiko including pleasure, pain, joy, resentment, and transcendence. In relation to this, could you speak more to how entering taiko through a binary lens, whether that be gender, sexuality, or race, holds us back from experiencing the fullness that taiko has to offer? Thanks, All right, yeah. Mila, good gosh, these questions, they are like, they're deep, you know? So, you know, like, wish me luck with even trying to <laughs> address it. Um, but, but, you know, let me just sort of say that, um, you know, like the further I go, the less sure I am that our, you know, like feelings are our own, um, you know, and, and I assume, you know, your use of the word affect, you know, is I, very critically deliberate, I think, you know, you're saying that you're referring to affect, you know, affect as like what, big configurations of emotion, you know, that are shaped by power structures that exist across people and cultures, right, are constructed historically and so on and so forth. And feeling, feeling is like how affect like comes home to roost in any of our um, individual bodies and subjectivities and so on. Um, so, I mean, to, to, you know, to sort of state the obvious, I think we're constantly surrounded by really powerful narratives telling all of us what to feel, you know, and how and when to feel, you know, movies and TV, you know, for instance, you know, and, and we can watch oppositionally, you know, as Bell Hooks, among many others, has, has taught us. Uh, I hope we watch oppositionally and experience those, those, those big narratives oppositionally. But I think music in particular often teaches us about music and a uh, rather feeling and emotion in ways that um, really deeply weave heterosexist assumptions, you know, into the very fabric of our, our beings, right? And, and the feminist music scholars with whom I spend a lot of time uh, talk about um, the really fraught ways that we end up um, experiencing uh, music of many, many different kinds, as a matter of fact. Um, you know, we are, we are able to enjoy music, of course, and that's often what drew us to music, and of course, for me, Tycho, to begin with, you know. But um, an example, um, I don't know about you all, but I always have, like, music playing in my head, whether I want it to be there or not. And um, <laughs> today, uh, if the earworm that's running through my brain, even right now as I sit here, is I'm hearing Dolly Parton sing um, Jolene. Okay, you know, Jolene, 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 please don't take him just because you can, right? Think about that for a minute, right? I mean, I can respond to that and I do, you know, affectively thinking, you know, oh, that's, that's beautiful, that's, that's moving, you know, that's, that's, that's heartfelt. I am so moved, right? But, but at the same time, my, my interior critical newsreel is in, you know, high gear, right? It's thinking, oh my God, that's sexist bullshit, you know? I mean, you know, what, what is that all about? Taking, having, you know, a man, what does, you know, you, you, you get the point, yeah. So like any, any kind of performance, um, Tycho, in my opinion, is only going to liberate us if we ask it to. It really comes down to that. I think it will only, what, slip between categories, you know, will only challenge binaries if we ask it to. Uh, if we don't ask it to, uh, any form of music, including taiko, can also harden our understandings of the world, can um, block us into master narratives, right? And I use that gendered uh, idea deliberately. Um, I think that taiko can allow players and audiences um, to sit very comfortably and very securely uh, in the categories that are provided to us by, by culture at large, you know, the media, our families, our friends, you know. And if Taiko players and Taiko audiences um, want to believe that music is a universal language or that race doesn't matter or that all lives matter, you know, then that is what they and we will learn from Taiko, you know, unless we insist otherwise is, is, is my opinion, you know. But what I, I've learned over and over again from politicized Asian American communities of, of practice, you know, including very especially Japanese American taiko groups, um, is that 
you know, feeling, you know, again, how affect comes home to roost in us as individuals, as individuals, that affect and the materiality of practice, you know, the sweat and the rumble of Taika, right, is full of, 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 of powerful potential. I really hold on to that uh, when it is channeled, when it is directed you know, towards uh, daring and often really difficult questions. You know, for instance, you know, what kind of BIPOC non-binary woman can I be? You know, um, how do our chosen identities crack open, you know, and allow something really different to emerge? Um, you know, and we think in those ways. When we think of, for instance, as the Asian American or the Asian Canadian, uh, and not as a, a locked identity, but rather as a position that chooses anti-racism or you know, refutes anti-blackness, you know? What if, what if, what if? What, if, what, what about a queerness that chooses um, a kind of utopianism? I'm thinking of Jose Munoz here, you know, utopianism not as a kind of fantasy, but rather as a way of imagining the world otherwise, um, you know, precisely because of, of refusing binaries, yeah. So I think the performative possibilities of, you know, moving between different feelings, um, which emerge from affective configurations, you know, joy, anger, pain, uh, connection, you know, all of that is part of the potential that Tycho really has, uh, most especially has. Um, but that also involves, of course, uh, the necessity of being willing to look at um, pain and anger. And I repeat, it will only happen if we have the political will to take Tycho there. Tycho is not, you know, magic. <laughs> no music um, is magic. No music is, is, is transcendent, as is often uh, claimed. So neither Tycho nor, nor any music really uh, floats above, well, the terrible things that, that culture sometimes tries to teach us. Uh, so for Tycho to take us, um, some are new, some are, some are better, um, some are principled, some are world changing, right? That's entirely up to us. I, I believe that quite deeply. And with that said, I'm seeing like really thrilling indications that um, the thought leaders in the North American Tycho world and community, probably beyond North America, are, are, are trying to take us there, are working hard to, to take us there and to clear spaces where those conversations can take place, you know. So of course I'm thinking of Michelle and Karen's, um, you know, forward meeting series over July. Of course I'm thinking about the nine week workshop that's about to start in September, the Healing, Unlearning, Growing um, initiative that's about to start. I'm thinking of the Women in Tycho initiative. You know, I'm seeing these remarkable spaces being opened up, you know, and I'm feeling a lot of hope and excitement you know, about that. So, thank you. Great. Thank you so much for um, a really full answer, Deborah. Um, really makes us think a lot, a lot about this um, complex question of a binary. So now I'd like to talk, uh, turn to Michelle. It's a question to Michelle. As an artist, co-director, performer, and organizer of Mimi and Taiko, how do you try to refute, refuse or challenge binaries in your work? How does this refusal inform your creative process, Michelle? Thank you. I, I feel like um, I'm grateful for all the words that have been spoken and, and Deb really dropped the mic. So I will, <laughs> I will really try to um, answer this incredibly meaningful question. Um, and I think I'm gonna go a little personal with um, my experience and answer. Um, just going from the flow of speaking um, from the first question of, of talking about feeling in many years of, of, of wrongness, um, I dedicated or I, I sort of made a, an intentional shift in my li life and felt compelled to spend uh, my time in pursuit of feeling okay. <laughs> and possibly even bigger than that, feeling great, feeling amazing. Um, so I, I, I did a pretty long deep dive in, in imagining, um, especially within my identity as stated as a Taiko artist, as a co-director, um, and all of these sorts of uh, things that I've done within the uh, 
Tyco community, especially since this is sort of my full time career and a pretty long, long life uh, passion of myself. Um, and uh, as I I, as I started imagining, I started imagining this word expansion. Um, I actually still have this <laughs> expansion. Um, it's actually a word for me um, that I, I strive uh, to uh, remind myself of because it's easy in boxes to feel confined, limited, smaller. Um, and so how could thinking of the title moving beyond moving beyond so like not even having these barriers around myself how can um i get into a life of expansion so it was easy for me to get stuck in comparison especially when getting in debates or conversations with some of my colleagues or peers um, i easily went into the either or worlds um, it needs to be this. I need to, to, in order to be free, I need to deny all these other oppressive others. Um, and, and then I kept coming back to that word expansion, expansion, expansion. So it became revolutionary and juicy for me um, when I started to live and ask myself to be in the both and. How can I shift my world into both and, which is, a, again, beyond the binary. Um, so I asked myself questions. How can we embrace both the historical gender disparities of our art form while also developing new ways of what this art form can be? Um, honoring past pathways and building new pathways. Um, acknowledgement of history and creating new traditions. I continue to ask myself within these um, sort of expanded ideas and identities without denying one and denying the other, but how can it be all of the above? Um, it's not easy, um, for sure, and it takes a lot of um, awareness. I have a pretty, right now, I, you know, I've been continuing to hone in on this process, but um, through just going through this, I've developed kind of this personal artistic protocol for myself which is to research, to name, to analyze, and to redefine. And so the research, and within all of this, it's a hyper-aware process um, and takes a lot of conversation and a lot of time. And when we think about that, all these are important um, things to acknowledge in regards to resource resources. And lots of times when we become um, time sensitive or when we become like, oh, tired of conversation um, or if we don't want to like re or look at the way we're getting there. Um, sometimes it gets into those dangerous slippery slopes I found. Um, so how has that sort of like come into uh, specifically your question and my work? Um, I in just a nutshell is um, I feel like uh, I I really done deep dives into vulnerable storytelling and what i mean there is um specifically starting to do work and content about the closed door things um the things that we don't often talk about but when we're there <laughs> on a, you know drinking beer or i drink wine um but <laughs> when we are there that's when those kinds of conversations come out or even in our household or even within our families how can we um show those um complexities of identity um that sometimes yeah the messiness is hard to um bring out it's very sensitive it's courageous it's also really brave um Currently, I'm working on a project that uh, is going through mo much more extension of um, its identity, which is called Constant State of Otherness. And it was an incredible deep dive of looking at each one of our own, there's five of us in this project, our own personal identities, um, acknowledging some of our connectivity of otherness, but also how each one of us have had to navigate that within our own lives. Um, I also just want to bring forward um, 
the, uh, th this is an example, when I was talking with Mila a little bit, and then she mentioned that I had, I had told her about this in my artistic work. And so this is an incredibly detailed example. So I'll just share this with you all now. Um, it's really questioning all these isms, all these um, binary definitions of one side being superior over the other. Um, looking at dehumanizing techniques and really questioning oneself. So this is the example. Um, one of the things, as we were doing Constant State of Otherness, for instance, it was all about storytelling. A lot of it was about family. But then when we would go and try to move the drums, so we'd try to move the drums, and we would go into the very calculated way, walk to the drum pristinely, pick up the drum, and then, you know, like, put it down nicely. Um, and it felt in, it felt in conflict with what we were doing. Um, this, this idea of being incredibly uh, perfect and pristine alongside with this open and vulnerability. And so we actually paused, we stopped, um, because these are the things that we train ourselves in Taiko. We see so many models of this on our stage. Um, and I'm not saying, I'm not poo-pooing it. I'm saying that that's um, also something to acknowledge, but it's also to acknowledge with awareness. Why are we doing that? Why are we um, needing, why is that our default, right? And if, if we need to, so we had lots and lots of conversations about that. Um, what started to come out was sort of like this Asian American um, perfectionism. We talked about perfectionism as this dehumanizing technique and and how we need to try to defy that just a little bit and and i just want to um i want to just acknowledge just one thing that i said because i said a word that oftentimes isn't um necessarily uh put out there which is the word hesitation i said that in my introduction and i just wanted to end with with talking about that because that moment of um intuitive just recognition was a moment of what I would call that hesitation or just going, huh, I wonder. Instead of just allowing that default to happen, we made that into a conversation. We made that into our work and it, it, it went into all parts of, for instance, this particular project. What are the isms that are coming out that are defaults that we're putting onto the stage that we sometimes we just do because we feel like we don't have time or in the name of the performance, we just go into the action of. Um, and these are rep just replications. And so we just, how do we, how do we get onto the stage in full awareness of our entire, I use the word embodiment quite a bit, in full embodiment awareness of myself and the agency that I have while I'm in and, and playing on this drum. These, these are the sorts of um, things that I, I think of the fullness, not just of like, I get to the drum and then everything starts. It's the whole moment that you are in this world. We don't turn on and off being on this world. So same thing in regards to um, thinking about ourselves and the creation of our performance. Um, and I just wanna say the word hesitation could also feel like it is in conflict with being myself or in being liberated. Um, but I want to say, again, as part of that process, it has been, the hesitation is just more of like this little moment where I go, wait a minute, let me just stop and think. And it's called, for me, it's called a radical intentional pause. It's not called stopping, the, stopping or like um, getting in the way. I don't get annoyed with that moment. I actually dive deep into that moment. Um, because that's when I feel um, my juicy parts come out and that's when um, I start uh, really having the ability to do some redefinition and to, to be much more fully present in the work that I, um, I'm in, I create, I work with an ensemble with. So anyways, that, that's my, my little sharing. Thank you. Oh, that was fascinating, Michelle. I really like that radical intentional pause uh, hesitation. Um, and that speaks to, uh, that leads to revolu revolutionary and juicy part of you. So that's, that, those are really key words I think I'm going to stick to. Um, and also that uh, resonates with 
um, meditation practice, mindfulness practice. I think you are part of the community and um, sort of hold that discomfort that we have and not jumping into jumping onto the uh, answer or solution, but just to you know hold yourself back and let that discomfort sit in you so that uh, something fuller would come out. So I think you articulated the process really beautifully. So thank you so much for that. Um, now I would like to, um, so there's a small change of plans for the panel panelists. I communicated in the uh, chat box for panelists, but um, anybody panelists would like to just say a few words um, or add anything to what you have said already or in response to other panelists? If there's anything that you would like to say, I'm gonna count three. And if nobody jumps up, then I'll move, we'll move to question and answer. All right, I'm getting the answers fine with you guys. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn to Mila for questions and answers from the yeah, audience. Thank you, Mila. Thank you so much, Izumi, for moderating. I'm gonna invite everybody to um, come back on video so that we can uh, take up some of these questions together and at least just share the virtual space before we wrap up. Um, we have a lot of questions and a lot of really wonderful questions and of course never enough time. Um, so what I think I'm going to do is offer a, a question that came through from when people registered. So one of the kind of pre questions and then one that's come up um, During our conversations today and then uh, I'll share all the questions with the panelists afterwards, maybe for for future thought and reflection, even if we don't get to take them up together. Um, so I think uh, and and some people have already spoken to this and this maybe also bridges um, one of the questions asked during the panel and one before, but um, a lot of people had questions about how, what are some of the ways to navigate situations where individuals might prioritize uh, tradition, which has been in quotes, uh, over or as an argument against gender equity. Um, how do we honor the musical history rooted in Japan while breaking away from acknowledging the harm and making amends that traditional notions of gender roles have maybe brought into Taiko's 21st century history? Um, and, and this is already a big question, but maybe I'll tack on in case different elements of the question resonate with different um, people or you want to speak to a different part. Um, but someone in the chat also asked, you know, um, what are the panel's thoughts on how patriarchal, racial, and cultural oppression intersect to the point that sometimes Japanese-ness is equated with patriarchy in this context? Um, so I'm gonna give a moment for that to sink in and then anyone please jump in um, with, your, with your thoughts. <laughs> I don't know if you can see, Mila, there was a request from Young to put the question in the chat, because <laughs> it's a big question. Yeah. <laughs> Good thought, Young. I'm going to just jump in by saying that um, the tradition doesn't, okay, that tradition is not one thing. So that's one. And that tradition can be uh, used to justify what you want to see or keep your privilege. So you need to see through that agenda. And the Japanese culture is not monolithic. And it just, it's evolving and there are multi parts, like so many parts to it. So one way of doing things could be that, but other ways of doing could be different. And there are people who are fighting within, struggling within and making new movements. So um, tradition can be used to, as an excuse to cover up the pitch, patriarchal agenda that somebody wants to uphold. And that might not be essence of the art itself, which is taiko. So don't let that, I don't let that argument um, be, be justify whatever somebody else wants to do. 
is my answer. But I think that in the more nuanced ways, uh, many people have struggled with that on the ground. Like Michelle, you are in Japan working with different artists and uh, so maybe you had other ways of, uh, of dealing with that kind of questions. Thank you for the invitation. I am still di I'm still absorbing um, this very dense um, question. <laughs> I uh, you know I guess first the word tradition um, is a, such a slippery word to me. It's a beautiful word in some ways, but it's so slippery because um, at some point a tradition was created, and that's that's what I love to focus on um, is how um, how we look at the that process. So tradition is something that reoccurs over and over and over again over a course of time, right? And so um, and. I think um, sometimes people use that word a little bit too, um, what's the, uh, superficially. And I, um, I would, I would, I mean, I honestly stop at that word tradition. It's like, if you're gonna start utilizing that as your justification already, I'm just going to talk about that one word. What does that mean to you? How do you define it? How do you understand it in the concept of like the long lineage of, of history? And also, why are you utilizing it um, in this sense of trying to, to make yourself right? That sense of righteousness is also um, really, really dangerous. All of these sorts of things, the sense of righteousness is, um, I don't know, a place in which I think everyone needs to be a lot more, again, the word expansive. There, is, there also needs to be acknowledgement of history, though, um, this patriarchal, um, racial and cultural oppression that has existed within our um, community slash art form is, is, like it is. And uh, for me, um, I want to have, hopefully we can say that it, it, it has happened, but the question is what do we want to do with that? Not, um, sort of say, just because it happened, we're going to stay there. That just feels a little lazy to me. <laughs> it just feels like, okay, well, I guess we don't have any ideas anymore. Um, I think that the idea of that is going, let's acknowledge that was, that is, um, and, and let's do something. Let's do something. There's lots of agency that we have with being able to name it um, and and then be able to um, do something. So that's, that's what I would say. Uh, I'll add something pretty brief. Um, as my, I think my, my knowledge of like Taiko history is quite limited and I'm also uh, not a Japanese person. Um, but one thing that has stuck with me and sort of an example that's coming to mind of how like this idea of tradition can change and we can create new traditions um, is uh, Hachijo style drumming, which is a history of drumming that I learned through uh, via Yuta Kato. Um, and I won't go into it because I don't think I'll be able to quite explain it in the time frame, um, or that I'm the best person to explain it. Um, but how different traditions can emerge and how it doesn't have to be a sort of, um, solid, um, unchanging idea and can be this fluid, ever evolving thing, which I think, yeah, that's the traditions. They, we create new ones and, and, and old ones, um, change and, and alter or fade or stop. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to, to sort of, um, mention that, uh, Hachijo style drumming, which from what I've understood is a style of drumming that is, um, really defies a lot of these traditions as being only for certain people. Um, and maybe I'll just write it into the chat if anyone wants to look into that history. I, oh, sorry, I just want to add to uh, what Michelle said. Uh, acknowledging the history is absolutely crucial with it's all the problems and uh, great things that are in it. So, um, for example, the 
uh, respect to the drum, the space, and the people, teachers, those things I feel are very important part of that taiko culture. And uh, not acknowledging that would be a violation, sort of a violence toward the art. So there are certain things I feel strongly, but uh, if you know, people think that only it's like confederation flag or you know us or canadian history and just because things have been done in certain ways it doesn't mean that it will justify what we do now so you need to discern what is healthy what's not um, what's not healthy what is to be upholded and i think the value of taiko culture culture uh, that's something that needs to be uh, you need to have more discussion on within the taiko community I think this is um, a nice transition point to our next question um, because a lot of people did have questions about how do we put these reflections into practice? Um, you know, what, what is that, um, how do we sort of live in the slipperiness of, you know, the term like tradition or um, tune into those moments of hesitation? How do we be discerning? Um, and I think behind that is also kind of a question of, um, sort of like, where's the integrity of our practice? What are the, um, the principles that are driving us if it's not tradition, but it's say um, respect for the drum and each other? Uh, what does that look like and how can, how can that shift um, you know, as we have these reflections? So um, one of the questions was, what practices do you recommend for dismantling the gender binary in community taiko groups? Um, and as part of that, someone also asked, you know, how do you address people in community taiko groups who have privileged identities? So what does it mean to um, deconstruct these binaries, not just in spaces where, um, where uh, you know, we're already making space for, say, a marginalized or underrepresented group, but in a community group often where you have um, a mix, you know, a multiracial mix of people and um, a mix of genders, uh, maybe Yes, sorry. Um, how do you address kind of privilege in those spaces while still trying to do this kind of um, dismantling work? Can you paste the question in the chat? Yes, I can. <laughs> Thank you. I think maybe I've never also been in a community type of group. So I guess I'm also curious, even just for people's reflections or, or experiences of navigating these questions in community groups. This is going to be very unsatisfying as an answer, but I would just say that well, luckily for all of us, um, we don't have to um, figure it out you know, from ground zero or from the ground up, you know, in terms of feminist pedagogy, um, um, so-called multicultural um, training techniques, um, you know, there's a great resource out there called the Asian American Anti-Racist Toolkit. You know, there, there are ways, <laughs> there, there, are, there are practices that folks have um, established and tried out and um, test driven uh, that we can draw from and, um, you know, uh, contribute to by trying them out, right? Yeah. So, so luckily, we don't have to start from, from zero. I, I could also just say a small thing to not to answer all parts of that question, but um, something uh, maybe easy that people could start doing right away in their Taiko groups is, is trying to look at the way that their group functions and how do they, how do they currently and what, what ways do they uphold this gender binary whether it's through gendered costumes or even specifically just the language that you use during practice can be a way to either uphold that binary or to get people thinking in different ways. Um, like instead of saying like, hey guys, let's do this, you know, like guys, it's like assuming a gender. Or like when you're in your performances saying, welcome ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> it's like another binary um, saying, you know, his or her instead of like, is hers or theirs. Um, just that kind of disruption in language. Um, you know, well, whether you ask 
people during introductions to also add if they'd like to their preferred gender pronouns and then explaining what that means. Uh, just can be a really easy way to get people in the group starting to think about, you know, the varied people that could exist within your group because it's not it's not always obvious. It hardly is obvious like uh, which people in your group might be struggling with, you know, their identities and maybe don't feel safe within the group to let everyone know about all parts of themselves. So in those tiny, tiny ways, we can uh, just over time, you know, do a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more to make the environment um, more positive and welcoming for everyone. I think maybe I'd also um, add to that, and I uh, like the way, Christy, that you framed um, also looking at kind of the way your group is organized and structured. Um, I think even questions around like, does it cost to join your group? Where does your group practice? Um, what languages does it use to advertise? Uh, I'm thinking around, you know, um, ways that uh, whether it's like location or finances or the time of practice or also something, Kirsty, that you said earlier about queer taiko, which is, you know, what is expected in terms of commitment. Um, are people penalized if they can't come as often? Um, is there flexibility in uh, what's considered, you know, full participation and thinking about what are the what are the kind of uh, ideologies that are being either upheld or um, unsettled a bit in the way that, that the group forms itself that way. Any other final thoughts to add to this question, Ku? Yeah, just to um, sort of add on or respond to everything that Chrissy uh, just mentioned, I think like in terms of how to dismantle the gender binary in community taker groups, there's so many different ways to go about doing that and also different ways of looking at this question. Um, and what um, what's coming up for me is just the do, doing the work of, of disrupting the status quo um, and also for like binary cisgendered um, allies to uh, take on some of that work as well and take on some of the unlearning work and um, take on the work of like disrupting the status quo and recognize that that is very vulnerable work a lot of the time for um, non-binary people to be doing and gender non-conforming people to be doing. Um, so uh, yeah, just thinking about like sharing that workload is an important thing. Yeah, I, th I think I might be coming full circle to echo something that Deborah started with, but I, I did want to address the part of that question that is specifically about how do you navigate things with maybe white folk in a group who ha don't recognize the privilege or want to kind of go into this post-structuralist, well, you know, everything is everything's a construct, so we don't need to worry about it. Um, and I don't have an easy answer to that either, but I do think that Deborah's right that there are a lot of resources right now, especially for, for you know, there are like syllabi online for white people to learn about anti-racism. And so, you know, maybe having a few things that are just in the back pocket, that's like, here's some, here's some resources that you can learn to about listen, learn, you know, turn to about listening. What is your role as a white person in a largely Asian American or um, other kind of space? I don't think it'll be that easy, but. Thank you very much. Um, I think this has been a really generative conversation. I know I've been really um, moved and grateful to hear everybody's contributions and reflections. And also I thank you very much for um, your care and, uh, and patience with the questions that I asked. Um, so this has been really wonderful for me as well. Um, so I'd like to say thank you to all of our panelists. Um, in terms of what happens next with this conversation that we've had, it's recorded. Um, I'm going to give all of the panelists a chance again after, uh, you know, maybe a couple of days have passed to revisit if they want to and give consent again for it to be shared. And um, in that case, I will uh, be adding captions um, to the recording and then it'll be published online. So for uh, those who didn't get to, to 
be with us live today. Um, hopefully that will be the next step. I'm also going to save the chat so we'll have these questions to continue reflecting on and working with. Um, and again, I just want to thank Tyco Community Alliance and in particular, um, Sarah Gilbert, who's been in the background running all of our tech, um, who has been really amazing and TCA has been really amazing this whole time. Um, so thank you very much for making programs like this possible. Um, this is maybe the smoothest webinar I've attended and I'm so, and I think it's all Sarah's technical genius. Um, so thank you so much for that. Uh, and yeah, with that, I think, I think we'll bring it to a close. So thank you very much, Izumi and Angela and Ku and Christy and Deborah and Michelle for being with us today. I think you can all sign off and we'll keep this work going. <laughs>